Please help me with welcoming you to Clark. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank all of you for showing up as well. Um, can you hear me okay, or yes. Yes. everybody okay? Um, yeah, so I'm going to be speaking primarily about my sculpture and performance work and my collaborative work by extension, um, all of which are intertwined in my practice. Uh, sculpture is a way for me to rethink, um, propose different ways of viewing and interpreting bodies beyond the harmful way by which all bodies are objectified, and to reimagine the physical and social spaces that govern our everyday lives. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'll be weaving back and forth between sculpture, performance, and collaborative projects and the spaces in between, while addressing the possibilities and limitations that I've found through each discipline, and how I navigate between multiple communities and spaces. Through this presentation, I hope to touch on concepts and themes including the objectification of bodies, self-objectification, reparative objectification, bodies as assemblages, trans-performance objects, queer genealogies, and the radical potential of marginalized bodies. So I want to start off with an excerpt of a, uh, a video that I made in 2012 in my first year of grad school here in my studio, which is right along the way. Um, it was a long night at the studio. It was a late night at the studio. I think I was preparing for you know, one of the reviews or whatever. I, um, yeah, and I, I was working on some ceramic sculptures at the time, actually, but, um, you know, in order to achieve the texture that I wanted on the surface of the clay pieces, I would mix slip, which is just like water and clay, in a bucket, dip my hand and fling it in this sort of like limp wristed gesture. <laughs> and then, so I'll just lay. So through the repetition of this gesture, I began to think of how femininity and queer identity could be pre-inscribed within a single gesture, a flick of the wrist. On the one hand, I was thinking, God, I just can't help myself. <laughs> Even when making art, just like a simple ceramic bowl, I'm such a queen. <laughs> but this led me to thinking of that gesture as a means of shedding of layers of bodily molding, of using flippancy as a sort of tactic for um, a mode of making art, a mode of creation. And that kind of like, you know, just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it's repeating, but. Oh, and I should, I should mention that the name of this uh, video is called uh, As If, which is the name of the nail polish color that I'm using. So it's a little secret if you ever have trouble with titles for your work. <laughs> so going back, Back a bit further, my first memories of rethinking the materiality of our bodies arose from my experience performing in drag, actually, at gay bars and queer parties in Chicago, outside of an art context. Drag taught me about the organizing function of materials to connote a race, gendered, sexed, and class body and revealed the potential for fracture, fracturing the underlying logic and identifications that are pre-inscribed into our bodies. So this allowed me to think of how material fragments could be manipulated in different ways, taken off, reapplied, reconfigured, in order to reimagine what a body could be and how it could exist in this world in three-dimensional space and within a community. 
Um, in many ways, I feel like my experience performing in drag uh, led to my sculpture practice. Um, so after years of being unsatisfied performing drag and lip syncing songs that long for the love and validation of a man, I started Zena Zerner in 2011 with my partner Marvin Astorga to write songs and create performances that um, manifest real rage, pain, struggle, joy, and laughter, um, and spoke to you know a traumatic core in uh, um, in myself, embracing the sort of other identity that I feel like I had not chosen but was rather forced on me as a queer, trans person of color. Um, so as Zena Zerner, I use a vocal transformer to continually change my voice, shifting my pitch uh, from little girl to deep voice man, monster, um, cyborg, uh, devolving into layers of unintelligible noise. I was thinking about how to achieve a sort of like trans voice in a way another mode of representing my body as I want to be seen, as continually transforming. So yeah, recently someone asked if like Zena Zerner is an alien, and <laughs> I, I told them that, you know, I think that Zena Zerner speaks in, to the alien in all of us. It's not just for, you know, queer people or, or POC, I mean it is, but it's, you know, ultimately refers to another, and as such, you know, we are all alien to some, but, um, you know, I think of it more like an alien hybrid, maybe, a melding of the familiar with the unfamiliar. Um, maybe that's the most alien thing of all. Um, Yeah, and my, so my voice is combined with Marvin's beats to get people dancing. I want to bring together people from different backgrounds so they can collectively experience and process the messy swirl of feelings through dancing and establish connections between different bodies and know that we can see and affect each other. In many ways, I feel the effective bonds between bodies are more immediate in Zena Zerner shows than in my sculptures. So just to give you... <laughs> Just to give you an idea of, uh, I'm going to show you an excerpt of a uh, Zena Zerner video for her song Burn Slow, which is about invoking Mother Earth to uh, um, mold our bodies from the clay of her earth and our, uh, burn our bodies with her flame in order to be transformed. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
a lot of imagery of death, decay, and despair. Um, one way I term our music and performances is sadical, like uh, radically sad. But um, Zena Zerner is profoundly about the need to survive and change, experiencing different kinds of death, the necessary sacrifices of past selves as a process of molding, of uh, transforming our bodies and ourselves. So this is just a body of work that I made um, around the same time as I started Zena Zerner. Um, I'm showing this as like a kind of like corollary. I feel like they were dealing with similar themes in a way. Um, I just read a book called Terrorist Assemblages by Jasper K. Puar, which offers a trenchant critique of the co-opting of queer and masculine identities in her book. Um, and brown identities in her book, and provides the concept of bodies as assemblages that are constituted by fragments that are spatially and temporally contingent. Poir's notion of the assemblage allows for the affects beyond cognition, the body's excesses. One can imagine the affects flowing in the spaces in between the seams of the fragments of the assemblage. The potential for transmission amongst these different fragments opens up the possibility of a variety of interactions and transformations. These cavities call to our attention the spaces in ourselves that elude our bodily senses, the gateways for the undetected, unmarked, or unvoiced. I think of this work as setting up an encounter um, with a sort of transfigured, traumatic uh, scene that uh, um, allows one to contemplate it. Uh, the mess, the spillage, the darkness. Um, so I'm gonna show you another excerpt of a, a video um, that I made called Makeup Play. Uh, just as another way of thinking of the materiality of our bodies through the lens of the formative experience of playing with makeup with one another as girls that never was. So as you could see, the interaction between bodies moves uh, from one of sort of like play, from collaborative creation, from tender and loving, to competitive, to rough and violent, um, using white porcelain slip in order to bring our bodies into being. 
the video, um, you know, I was thinking about converting like the formative beauty rituals of uh, um, socializing into a meditation on objectification and a way by which we are complicit in forming each other into subjects. So this is my excreted Venus. Mm -hmm. So like the pop diva exemplary bodies, um, I was just thinking about how exemplary bodies uh, are the mechanisms for the workings of power um, and that they invoke an identification in the viewer, you know, um, and just thinking, you know, what if the exemplary femme body of uh, beauty, prosperity, love, and desire was one of fluidity, formlessness, and fragmentation? Um, you know, imagining this figure as an icon for a newly radical form of uh, consumption and identification, I couldn't help but wonder what would become of these identifications of beauty, of, of gender, of race. Um, so this, everybody thinks that this is me, but it's actually my uh, friend Barack, who is a classmate of mine at USC, and he's like this like kind of like stout, really straight, hairy Israeli guy that I, um, uh, masculine, and I just like tied him up, applied makeup, wigs, <laughs> heels, and um, the strange proportions of his body are because it's a, um, actually a composite of different several, several different photos of photos of his body taken from different angles that have been patched together. Um, so this is also from the same shoot. This uh, so it's you know not a human body as a discrete whole organic thing, but one of fragmentation again and uh, resisting the um, you know it's it's more just about the continual process of beauty you know bodily transformation that's ambiguous uh, ambivalent confounding sort of bondage art making rituals and beautification rituals all of So I, I see our bodies as sites of radical contradiction. How a body presents itself, how it is read, belying its true, lived, yet unperceived nature. I see sculptures as a way of reimagining resistance and agency for marginalized bodies. With this body of work, I was thinking through the idea of sort, the sort of trans-femme sculpture. What are the stakes? Resisting notions of wholeness, singularity, solidity, permanence, rigidity. The fluid materials and forms used in the sculpture reflect the mutability and open-endedness of trans bodies. A lot of the materials are perishable and variable in their installation, reflecting a sense of our own transience. So these are some of the sculptures that were reconfigured again. Um, so I think of these as being bodily, fragmentary, the shapes and materials embodying the score for a sort of impossible choreography. Um, also, the sculptures create a promenade, the promenade for themselves, uh, for viewers to enact their own sort of choreography and how they navigate the space. Just that gesture. <laughs> Not only how identifications are inscribed into gestures, but how gestures can be inscribed into materials. Um, I guess I should. Uh, the um, prints on transparent film that are mounted to this resin steel piece is uh, their um, image photos of uh, oil slicks. The rainbows that result from like dirty water. So this piece is called Wig, Heel, Purse. It's literally a wig, heel, and purse <laughs> that has been welded together. It's a weapon, an object of beauty and consumption, and a body itself. So each side of the plexiglass case is a different shade of transparent pink, meant to encourage looking at it from different angles. The holes are at once air holes and the approximate diameter and height of glory holes. Um, to consider the overwrought bonds of femininity and violence, sexuality and pleasure. So 
So at Xena Zerner shows after moving to LA in 2012, um, we found such a strong community of queer trans POC and um, you know women X audiences, <laughs> and I would witness performances at these so-called non-art venues at like 2 a.m. in some basement <laughs> where that blew my mind and made me wonder why isn't this in an art gallery? At the same time, I was in grad school here and needed to make my art studio into something of a dressing room because I didn't feel safe to get dressed and made up in my apartment um, <coughs> at the time. So I created Mutant Salon. Uh, I had the privilege of having the space and platform that comes with institutional backing. And I wanted to extend this safe space with my community um, to collaborate with them, to bring my community from the outside in, to share my studio, my sort of green room by which we would get made up and share ideas and prepare for performances on the horizon. And Mutant Salon was also just like a metaphor to think of my practice, kind of thinking if artists are meant to create new forms of beauty, I guess I would align myself with a sort of mutant beauty. So Mutant Salon became this roving, um, you know, after grad school, freeform salon slash platform for collaborative performance and community building. Um, you know, I, I it's, it's hard to, <laughs> to kind of wrap it all in one thing. There's not one single polemic or mission statement about us, like, because we are all so different, but I think that one thing that unites us all is that we all experience having our bodies objectified, exploited, or policed in some way. Together, we create a temporary world with and for each other in which the conditions of our everyday lives are inverted. I think of Mutant Salon as a sort of temporary autonomous zone, um, to borrow a term from Hakeem Bey. <laughs> In past iterations of the salon, I've collaborated with other artists to create the environment of the salon using objects, light, sound, video, where audience members could get makeovers, such as haircuts, psychic readings, ma makeup, nails, body work, etc. Um, yeah, I think a mutant salon is like, it's, it's only, it can only be what it is at the moment when everyone is envisioning it and and uh, experiencing it together. Um, and people who, you know, and it's not an aesthetic one <laughs> that people can take away as a model for a sort of different social being. So artist and writer Gordon Hall proposes something called reparative objectification in his essay, Reading Things, which speaks to the creation of collective space in Mutant Salon in which we collectively counteract the damaging effects of being objectified through mutually objectifying each other, interfacing with one another as bodies, but doing so in a way that supports rather than tries to destroy one another. I found myself thinking about some other reparative process, one that countered the damaging kind of objectification with an even more powerful kind of objectification. I wanted us to treat each other like objects in profound affirmation, to learn to see each other, to look at one another as bodies and say, yes, this is much of what we do on the dance floor, embrace rather than disavow our objectness in a space that allows us to do so without the risk of dehumanization that usually accompanies objectification. So at Mutant Salon, we could show our bodies without shame and they could be covered in trash and you know, we might look monstrous, but still beautiful, because we make each other beautiful. So with Mutant Salon, like the idea of Mutant Salon also kind of precipitated the, like, uh, the, the objects that, and, and things that I would make for Mutant Salon, and um, in this case, these mu musical beauty instruments uh, that we used at uh, performances at the Broad and Hammer Museum where performers and audience members use these to apply makeup and paint sculptures on the surrounding installation. Um, but these musical beauty instruments also create sounds via embedded uh, contact mics and other electronics that when activated are f um, and filtered through software uh, um, 
so that like the stroke of a brush against one's skin sounds like sparkles or wiping your face with a sponge sounds like waves or brushing your hair sounds like a demolition at a construction site. <laughs> um, and so with that singing mirror at the end, its volume and tone changes based on the tilt of each axis of the embedded wireless accelerometer. So in having your own gaze reflected back at you, rather than telling you you're not the prettiest one, it sings for your beauty. So we were invited to do more exhibitions where our bodies wouldn't be present throughout the duration of the exhibition. So we wanted to explore another means of participation with the audience, creating a sort of surrogate body. So this interactive sculpture houses a speaker, computer, and other electronic components for the musical beauty instruments used by audience members to apply makeup. And yeah, here it's uh, installed at Commonwealth and Council. This is the aftermath of, yeah. <laughs> and just to give you a little bit of an idea of what a um, past mutant salons have been like, this is documentation of um, our performance at the Broad. And using the musical beauty instruments too. Sorry, I don't know why. So um, this is just like a sort of, to give you an idea of some of the objects and installations that we create. Um, so my role as like the host slash author is heav heavily uh, rooted in the creation of objects and spaces that set the scene or create the occasion, the scenario involving other voices for a variety of unforeseen interactions to occur. Um, So uh, Mutant Salon was invited to do a show at Red Cat, um, and I was thinking about how to transmute the ephemeral nature of Mutant Salon performances through different mediums, rather than just the residue of a performance, or one's account of a performance, how can the performance live on? Um, beyond just the documentation of the performance, we wanted to use the documentation in order to create a video piece. Um, and I'm not gonna show you that video. <laughs> but it, this is all to say, I was really interested in um, uh, chroma key or green screen technology at the time as well, as a stand-in for any sort of, uh, like any kind of space that you want to build, a space that is otherwise, is always on the horizon. So we created uh, furniture and objects using chroma key paint, and um, you could see an excerpt of that video on my website, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna show you a different one. Uh, so after I started making the musical beauty instruments, I, um, this project also involved the green screen um, for a live performance in a gallery and a live streamed video with um, effects that were transposed onto the chroma. Um, the performance involved a chroma key green screen background with the performers wielding matching chroma key colored objects and costumes. So my interest in like the green screen uh, 
stems from the fact that, like, you know, it traditionally, historically has prov provided cinema with an infinite sight within an infinite scale in which to position the subject. But using analog technology to substitute chroma for an alternative sight, um, you know, the image is allowed to move from the actual to the potential. I was interested in treating the green screen as a subject equal to the figure, not simply a ground for the figure as it has been used historically. Substituting chroma for a swirl of different body parts, fluids, and environments, um, the image and, of the body and the site is shown to be a relationship of uh, indeterminate materiality. Oh, so this is just a documentation of both um, bits of like the live performance with, uh, I don't know why it's doing that. Oh, there it is. Live performance with the live stream video too, mm -hmm. just for the sake of realizing what was going on. to create an exercise video <laughs> for um, exorcise video for which I created tools that were used by performers to you know push their bodies to the limit the <laughs> unobtainable convo you know like our um, mutant salon shake weight and the <laughs> ass pump and, and then this um, you know I wanted to not just display the exercise tools as props for them to function as a sculpture as well. I decided to create a rack for the exercise tools, just as the exercise tools queer the objects that one would use in order to modify one's body toward certain ideals, the rack takes on a sort of strange functionality itself. A tool rack, an exercise machine, an aggregate sort of body. Um, you know, I think of these as sort of these objects, like the musical beauty instruments and such, as, as sort of trans performance objects, objects that are at the interstices, like in the in-between spaces of um, performances that teach us about pushing the boundaries of, uh, um, you know, performances as, as much as like a performer's movements and um, that audience members can participate in extending the performers and uh, performance and kind of disidentifies the performing body. So I created a sculpture exhibition at Commonwealth and Council um, in 2017 called Her Me, or Her My, or, um, that was inspired by ancient Greek Hermes statues and the uh, deity Hermaphroditus. Um, so Hermes statues, if you're not familiar, are square columns bearing only heads of the gods and genitals as figurative markers of masculine power and authority. They were placed in front of, uh, in, in olden times, they were placed in <laughs> the front of properties of people in positions of power to mark one's territory, to claim, like, claim space, as, you know, and so, uh, I wanted to subvert that original function of Herma statues and claim the space of the exhibition as queer and trans and intersex. The piece was named after um, Herculean Barbon, the French intersex person from the 19th century whose memoirs I read after Foucault brought attention to them in his history of sexuality. Um, so the genitals on the one side of the Herma Herculean is one configuration of my 
uh, vaginas or vagina penis. I'll return to that later. <laughs> as I like to vaginas, as I like to refer to it. Uh, this configuration consisting of gonad gonads bulging out of my vulva. Um, I was also drawn to the Hermes statues after a public conversation that I did at SVA just a few months earlier with Gordon Hall, uh, who's a trans man, the author of that quote that I read to you before, um, who's kind of at the forefront of this sort of movement of queer minimalism. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and some of, you know, his writing touches on like kind of denying any signifiers of queerness in their visual work. And I became self-conscious of how I was being positioned as this sort of messy, queer, tranny, maximalist in relation to Gordon during this talk. Like, this is kind of like really like binary, like, oh, I didn't know that I was walking into this like that. Um, and for me, I thought about like the sort of privilege of passing as well, in a way. Um, you know, there are trans people who can pass as their actual gender and those that cannot, often based on race, class, and access to resources. Minimalists had announced that the content in the form is the content is the form from a so-called objective viewpoint, but it made us understand that the height of modernist conceit, the universal, if reproduced, represents a power structure of a specific biology, class, and race, and that's not universal. I was interested in how Hermes statues joined figuration and minimalist abstraction. I was interested in a queer formalism that combines minimalism and maximalism, that doesn't see itself as one side of a binary, but rather locates itself within a genealogy of sculpture and expands upon this discourse without having to deny its queer subjectivity, with all of subjectivity's com complicities and messiness. And so, you know, this is a, a picture um, an image of the sleeping hermaphroditus statue that I have a, um, at the Louvre. Uh, I was interested in creating a genealogy within art history in order to see and make sense of where we are at collectively in, you know, in terms of the conflict and confusion around describing and classifying trans bodies. Um, at the time, I was thinking about this a lot uh, at the time, there was a lot of like legislation going on, such as like the transgender bathroom bills that the government was using to further police trans bodies, all based on what your genitals look like and not considering our actual selves. I thought back to an early memory of encountering the statue of Hermaphroditus at the Louvre when I was a young kid from Jersey who traveled to France for the first time and in Greek myth, um, you know, in Greek myth, Hermaphroditus was meant to synthesize the ideals of the masculine and the feminine, and, and you think about all the infinite ways by which that could be represented, and the, the subtle nuances of the feminine and the masculine, and, uh, but most often it's reduced to mostly female form with a penis, like a chick with a dick. You know, and I, I have like this really distinct memory of like seeing this at the Louvre, like on this side of the uh, statue, and just like seeing that sinewy femme form, and seeing people like giggling behind it, and going over, and then seeing that. Um, so this is my uh, lion hermaphroditus, which is cast fiberglass resin piece in the same pose as a statue, um, cast from my friend Alice. Uh, but reoriented so that the expectation to reveal one's identity is replaced with a position of active defiance. Totally accidental, too. I just needed to like put her up against my student. But I was like, yeah, that works. But here I displayed it on, um, you know, for a show actually with Mother Culture that was just uh, at the Baxter Stairs in uh, um, Elysian Park. Uh, and. Yeah, I thought she's working there too. So this is another statue of Hermaphroditus at the Louvre from ancient Greece. So oftentimes Hermaphroditus and similar um, figures, deities throughout different cultures are, are often represented lift, 
you know, via lifting of the fabric of their garment to re for the salacious reveal of their genitalia. Um, you know, the reification of this gen gesture throughout Western art history proliferates the conflation of hermaphroditism, intersex, transgender, cross gen, yeah, whatever, um, in the present day. And um, looking back at this statue, I was thinking about its age materiality. I know that they were originally painted, um, but you know, looking, looking at the statue now, absent of any color, there's no clear demarcation, like there's no clear indication of where the fabric ends and the skin begins, where the fabric ends and the genitals begin. And you know, is it being lifted up? Is it being placed down? It's all body, right? And so these um, served as, this statue was served as inspiration for the sort of fabric and body works in my uh, Hermaphroditus' Reveal series. So here the fabric reveals negative space and the relationship between the space, fabric, and bodies is of indeterminate materiality. This piece highlights inconclusive discovery. A hand lightly holds the back flat between two fingers as if preparing to uncover the truth by this ambiguous form, but I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> and just like that same kind of gesture of like the lifting of the fabric in a way is So multiple layers of fabric of concealing and revealing. And I wanted these pieces to gesture toward the many subtle nuances of a body that contains hidden multitudes. So at the same time, I was actively looking for surrogates for genitalia and mass media and consumer culture and came across these male sex toys, um, these silicone tubes slash sleeves for male masturbation of which the most popular brand is called Fleshlight, but particularly looking at the ones that were marketed as looking and feeling just like real vaginas. I would invert these and notice the manufactured geometry of these forms that would also shift into forms that were more organic and alien, which made me wonder like, huh, so that's woman. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and on the one hand, these casts like replicas of, like they're supposed to be cast replicas of a vagina, but on the other hand, it's meant to fit or be a mold of a penis in a way. Um, the soft, squishy materiality of a silicone body has been transmuted to one of hard, solid cast resin. Um, its male masturbatory function has been rendered useless to one of aesthetic contemplation, its form highlighted by the silver leaf and unsealed so that it continues to slowly tarnish over time. So the bases were gonna be their own sort of Herma statues, but rather than thinking of a bust on top, it seemed fitting to place these little vaginuses on top rather than heads. So, I don't, yeah, I'm sure, you know, you don't have to reveal yourselves, but I'm sure many of you, well, I don't know, okay, let's, like, if you receive as many dick pics as I do, perhaps, you know, you'll begin to start noticing some recurring objects placed in relation to one's penis. <laughs> the two most common objects that pop up are an aluminum can or a beer can and a remote control. So another example of a gendered and sex surrogate for genitalia that's being mass produced in material culture. This my little vagina wreath. Um, so this is a, an installation shot of one of the rooms of my last uh, uh, exhibition, Her Hermie. Um, and sculptures were scattered about the space of different scale, color, installed at different heights and in locations of the gallery, such as the ceiling, and corners, et cetera, that responded to the strange architecture of the space. Um, so these images don't quite ref reflect how particular and mostly dim the lighting was for the exhibition. The primary light source was from a um, LED RGBA light shining on a reflective piece in the center of the main gallery, excuse me, resembling an exploded mirror ball. Um, 
this was the light source. And, and these are some of the objects that were kind of like scattered and installed at different heights and locations of the space. And you know, I wanted to encourage the audience, and this is something that I think about always with my shows, is that I want to encourage the audience to engage with the space more with their bodies, to compel them to be in the space and engage with the work differently from how they would typically view art. Um, you know, I know when I go into a gallery, I'll do this like sort of walk around, like I don't even move my head up and down. I just figure that everything is at 60 inches centered and I'll just like do one scan across the room and oh, I might look at this piece a little longer or that piece a little longer, but. Um, and this was uh, um, the exploded disco ball called a uh, brown rainbow eclipse explosion. Um, well, and it was accompanied by this uh, sort of soundtrack, that uh, score that uh, my partner Marvin made. Um, so, Hermy Gaze shines its light onto this body that has been gouged out, exploded, producing a brown shadow that radi radiates out into a rainbow. This piece is accompanied by a slow, ambient sound composition. Uh, it's made of cast aluminum, um, you know, so it's heavy but strong and uh, um, in its fragmentation. And I, I realized that it's like a, it's like become a generational thing, like it's not like this so much anymore, but you know, the mirror ball had a very significant um, special cultural historical significance for me and others who found refuge in gay clubs and other nightlife venues. Uh, they were essential in creating um, an atmosphere for escape, uh, release, freedom of expression, celebration, and hope. When the world beats you down, you can die and be reborn again and again on the dance floor. I wanted this piece to exist as a sculpture in the show, but also for it to provide a different sort of phenomenological function in changing our viewing patterns. So fragments of light reflected by the sculpture slowly um, move around the space at one and a half rotations per minute, the approximate speed of like a slow dance, uh, leading viewer sight lines to sculptures installed in various locations, in effect, slowing down individual moments of recognizing a thing as a particular kind of thing, a, a body as a particular kind of body. I want to draw viewers' attentions to the bodily fragments or affects that commonly elude our senses. These moments allow us to glimpse our own attunement to particular limited frequencies, a particular positionality as subjects. I want to encourage viewers to look slower, look around you, look closer, look deeper, allow for a delay and disorientation in viewing and categorizing bodies. By engaging in this slower mode of looking, we may begin to restructure um, how we engage with our own lived bodies. This is a collaboration with uh, artist Corazon del Sol. Um, we were thinking about this as like the space for the exhibition. This was like a room off to the side for when one was tired of looking at, of, a, of looking at art. <laughs> <laughs> but also just like a kind of different way by which the fiberglass fabric takes on another role in this space from the base molding and surroundings uh, to the running fountain. Um, to the curtains that frame the little bits of light that enter the room, creating a space that represents an interiority, um, you know, the apex of minimalism. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in summer 2018, I, along with Mutant Salon, was invited to be the summer artists in residence at uh, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. Uh, the site was so meaningful for me because of its location on Hollywood Boulevard, the Walk of Fame, on the same block as all the wig stores and other stores that cater to drag queens, trans women, sex workers, and the kink community, and the, with the nation's largest LGBT sliding scale clinic uh, right around the corner, along with tourists the world over, um, you know, not just an art audience. Um, 
And, you know, I wanted to designate Lace as femme, trans, gender, non-binary, plural, and inclusive of all genders. She, her, they, them is all one continuous LED neon rope shining as a beacon of welcoming. So um, this is an installation shot of uh, uh, the show Cavernous. Um, it was kind of, yeah. Uh, the idea for cavernous proceeded from the, the work I was doing with vaginuses and male sex toys and beer cans and remote controls and all that was missing was a lazy boy and you'd have the trappings of a man cave. Um, you know, I, I, began, uh, I began researching man caves and specific feminist analyses of the man cave as the last bastion of manhood in the domestic space when femme authority is taken over. Um, in any case, on one side of the gallery was, uh, so this is like the side of the gallery where I had some sculptures and a, um, along with what I was calling like a sort of living queer archive uh, that reclaims the race narratives and traces a lineage of, um, you know, uh, radical present future queer arts communities in LA. The archive featured a selection of unclassified objects by unknown artists from the One National LGBT Archives, as well as custom wigs by stylists from historic Hollywood, uh, uh, Hollywood wigs um, displayed on ceramic wig stands um, that I, I kind of wanted to make to like kind of provide the platform and as a tribute to these uh, wig stylists. Um, the one that, did, you know, uh, two of the three was Rosar. You know, there are all the wig stylists were um, like have been making wigs for like forty years too, and like Rosario Rivera is like you know an immigrant from Guatemala, and um, yeah. Um, what was I? Yeah. So the archive also uh, included a screening of video works and documentation by you know, uh, local performance artist jo jo Johanna Went. It was Lace's 40th year anniversary and I wanted to use this opportunity to connect to the community of Mute Salon with um, Lace's 40 year history of supporting queer and feminist performance art. So, um, the surveillance mirror vaginas reflects the other sculptures in the space in the room. Um, in its vaginal yet convex mirrored surface. Uh, these are some of the um, objects that I borrowed uh, from the one archives. They're all kind of like, you know, the, the penis transformed. <laughs> like the dildo transformed into different configurations in different ways, but you know, in material functionality or form. And, Kind of, um, and then they're all like by unknown artists, unknown, uh, you know, they lack any kind of contextual information. And so I think about them as sort of like transhistorical objects in a way. Um, and these wigs kind of mirroring some of the similar forms as like the uh, borrowed objects. On the other side of the gallery was a space of Mutant Salon, which uh, I gave over entirely to the other members of Mutant Salon, um, featuring par performative participatory sculptures, videos, lounging spaces, a zine library, a spring, a human-sized cat trees, <laughs> slash set for Zeta Zerna music video, and seating for performances by members of Mutant Salon and programs. Um, So this, uh, in the fall, la last year I did a, um, I had a show at the Walter Phillips Gallery at um, um, the BAM Center for Arts and Creativity where I met Los. And um, yeah, so the cave uh, builds on pre-existing work, rethinking the aesthetics of the man cave through a sort of queered reading. Um, but through a process of like intense research and collaboration with the gallery's chief curator, um, Jacqueline Bell, I found that another cave 
uh, Banff's legendary, the cave and basin, is the reason that Banff National Park and the entire Canadian national park system exists. Thus, the show came to respond to the history of Banff National Park and the legacy of artistic practices that have engaged with the uh, um, complexities of the region. So the, simply put, the story goes that in 1859, railroad, railroad workers saw steam venting from a crack in the rocks on the side of Sulphur Mountain. Um, they descended into this cave and discovered hot springs, which was the opportunity they were seeking to make money to bring tourists to the area, which led to the displacement of seven indigenous nations and the formation of Canada's first national park. Um, so stalactites and stalagmites are evoked through words that drip in resin, while others transform familiar geometry and architecture into beings with orifice-like holes. Um, this was the first time I had created bronze uh, works, creating bronze casts of um, inspired by the Banff spring snail, um, the most at-risk species found exclusively in the thermal pools of Banff. Um, the vast disappearance of the population of the Banff spring snail is attributed to the rise of Banff's tourism industry and human interaction in its fragile habitat. So merely swishing your hand in the water can destroy its food source. Uh, these snails were the starting point for me to consider marginalized bodies within the context of the site that I was having an institutional exhibition in. It's just another. Um, so, back to the um, significance of the Banff spring snail. I was, I was, you know, really interested in it, not just because snails are really hot right now, and, <laughs> which I didn't, you know, but like, like many similar species, the snail has the capacity to self-reproduce, displaying mo both male and female sex organs. Um, but the Banff spring snail specifically has a shell unlike many others, for rather than smi uh, spiraling to the right, like many land and sea snails, it curls to the left. Around the size of a small fingernail, it go often goes unseen and is subject to strict regulations with human interaction. So the Banff spring snail provides an initial form for contemplating the radical potential of the joining together and mobilizing of a collective of marginalized bodies in this way. Um, I've been working with like resin cast using different metals along with rocks and uh, um, dirts and different like kind of, you know, plastics and natural compounds. Um, these, this is like a cast of a, um, uh, my friend Edie's hand along with interior casts of the um, uh, of the fleshlights. She could see the forms better. This is another surveillance mirror work. Um, my cave's basin, I guess you could say. But. So I also showed a new three-channel film installation called The Maternal River of No Return as part of an ongoing performance film collaboration with artist-performer Kim Yi uh, called Not Yet a Woman, in which Kim embodies an overbearing older maternal figure guiding me through a fractured transition into a stereotypical womanhood and destructive womanhood. Um, the, three channel, the three channels show different activities, places, and personas that mommy and baby girl occupy in order to learn about the site and its history and to try to fit into the local culture amidst the uh, melodrama of their relationship. The center film channel shows mommy and baby taking a stroll through the busy streets of downtown Banff, with the camera focusing on the moments of passerbys turning their heads and the subtleties of bodily responses to our bodies in that space. Um, so, you know, the, this 
film installation. We wanted to shoot this like kind of, you know, I felt like it allowed us to sort of critically reflect on our subjectivity as outsiders, as tourists, as foreigners on this land, and um, you know, and because we saw so many other Asian tourists at Banff, and we wanted to like kind of play on those stereotypes and misrecognitions of identity in relation to these touristic, poly, you know, populations. Um, this is a scene of us in the uh, one of the film channels glamping. This is our <laughs> glamping tent in the, <laughs> with a, um, a pillow that's like transparent pink vinyl filled with uh, um, Banff dirt. Um, so, I, you, she, he, they, we, it. Uh, each pronoun is spelled out by bending and twisting neon rope and attached to a sheet of plexiglass, all of one long continuous line suspended like a chandelier from a security dome mirror, a surveillance mirror on the ceiling. The piece changes visually and linguistically depending on the angle from which it is viewed. Words and letters appear and disappear. Their power to signify is in flux, all making a line abstraction that imbues a purple glow around the space. This piece is titled Shining Palimpsest, referencing the multiple and interrelated layers of meaning and obfuscation in language, subjectivity, and social divisions. The surveillance mirror, I mean, has to do with how trans bodies and marginalized bodies are surveilled and policed. But in this case, the function has been twisted to reflect and shine ambient light all over the space, shifting. Um, yeah, there was a lime green painted wall that um, with this light reflected would appear orange or salmon colored. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I, how, how am I doing on time? I, like, I have a mommy and baby excerpt, but um, I think I could, I could stop here and maybe if there, you know, if nobody has questions or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, no, not okay. specifically the Peruvian penis pot, but one of the objects from the World Archives really reminds me of that. That's, yeah, that's what yeah, I yeah. They're like these remote, primarily ceramic pots that they were used over a number of centuries from a number of Peruvian cultures in the same geographic area. Um, and they're all like these weird images of like sometimes the, the figure is the pot and like the penis is or it's like yeah. seen like sex scenes on these pots and so your a lot of um, your more figurative works reminded me a lot of that um, and just kind of like the ways that that those were very like uh, I don't know what the word is but they're found a lot there's a lot of them they're not like rare instances um, and that that way that they like as both I don't know it was just very interesting and it like kept a lot of the I, I haven't, but I will now that you mentioned it. <laughs> 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 you go to like little, um, like little, yeah. little tour stands and stuff like that, and they'll have like mini ones for you to, for you to buy. Uh, like yeah, like yeah, like I've seen a lot. That look like them. Uh huh. Sorry, no, thanks. No all these different practices is really kind of all feeding the same thing, especially kind of your work with um, Zina Zerner, 
I'm wondering actually, it, when you first talked about it, it was kind of like a wellspring or a safe space from which you could actually kind of make work. I'm wondering if that has kind of changed in terms of the space of the band itself and kind of like what the band does for you and your work or if it's kind of evolved, because your work kind of formally has really kind of evolved as well. I mean, in terms, yeah. of, the, in terms of kind of the forms that you, you use and kind of how the exhibitions look, whether they look kind of super maximalist, as you said, or like the vamp thing is like super strained and like, you know. So I'm, I'm curious as to like what the, what the status of Zena Zerner is now and how it affects the work. Yeah, well, we're um, playing a few shows yeah. in the next month, you yeah. know, and just <laughs> at, uh, at, at, you know, n mostly like non-art venues and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just I uh, I it, it it allows me to like reach another audience mm -hmm. and kind of like the kids like that I want to reach mm -hmm. and I feel like I make work for too um, in a way. But I also love the work that I do <coughs> in galleries and the kinds of audiences that I'm able to reach through the, that work. And they are very vastly different audiences sometimes. And I don't know, it gives me life and keeps me young. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, I love the gesture you started your presentation with, with like looking at your wrist. And um, working collaboratively with people, you're taking in like all these like signifiers and creating them for yourself. And I wonder where you stand on the idea of like creating your own personal mythology. Because I saw the flip of the wrist repeated like throughout mm -hmm. your sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are any other gestures that have sort of become a part of like your mythology that repeat in your practice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, like what what kinds of gestures? Like I think I that know, they're like, like kind of like as a yeah, like like a limp wrist <laughs> like, or I don't know, uh, I, I, yeah icons like things that we, icons, like, like yeah. things that you create that, that you yes. feel like repeat throughout your practice over and over again. That yeah, like you look at as like your own sort of language you're creating. I don't know. Yeah, I mean I um. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot that just like come up. I don't um, try not to think about it in the way of like kind of creating uh, too much of like an, or like recapitulating some sort of iconography or right. yeah, but um, but yeah, kind of like mixing. Unfamiliar with familiar and kind of like shifting it around, but then also, yeah, I think it's um, important to build upon each from you know how each project kind of contextualizes the next and the one that came before and stuff like that. So I don't know if I answered your no, question. No, that's not him. Yeah. <coughs> Can you show the video that you mentioned? Oh well. Um, yeah, sure. The video, the, oh, that's the security mirror. But. So I was going to show a video of the, per, um, like an excerpt of like uh, the most recent performance that I did on Hollywood Boulevard this past Saturday. Um, and so I could just show you that. It involves my baby. And it's in relation to the preferred pronouns piece. Oop, wait. And mommy and baby is preferred for me.
I'm just gonna um, give me one second, and I'll just start it from that same place from there.
Thank you. Thank you.